Judy, thank you. That was a great word and great spirit. Yes, you did. I thought it was great. Thank you. Father, we ask that you bless our time together, that you'd speak from your heart to our heart. Lord, we are so grateful to belong to you. And Lord, we want to keep growing up into Christ in all ways. Today we're going to talk about prayer, Lord, and I wanted to have the focus and the intensity and the clarity, Lord, that you have given us and modeled through Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I ask that you would lift up your church and lift up his name, and our time together would bring you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, in the back, there's some sheets like this. It says, Principles for Effective Intercession. Today, I'd like to talk about three different levels of prayer, and kind of the top of that would be the... Uh, the experience of intercession. So like this building has three levels to it, this first floor, second floor, third floor. Uh, you can't do without the first floor. If you say this is where we began, but it's not important anymore, that's it's inappropriate, it's wrong. The whole building would collapse if somebody were to knock this part of it out from underneath. So uh, they're built on one another. And in prayer, we can go as far as we want to go, but there's a cost to it. And we have to decide if we're willing to pay the cost and if we understand it clearly enough. Uh, Alex, welcome. And Jonathan's up here. So you're welcome just to go straight up there. Yeah. Thank you. Glad you're here. Um, so I don't believe there's anything that our enemy will come after more earnestly and is more intent in destroying in our life than our prayers and our prayer life. And so it means to me, that there's nothing that we need to guard more diligently than that prayer life. First of all, because it's the way we communicate with God. And if that communication is limited or hindered or cut off, uh, we're left just stranded. We need to hear from God, know that he's alive and he's active in the things that he's called us to be a part of and where he's leading us. Uh, Pastor Dave's been doing a great job on the practical implications of our life in Christ. and. But we can't do that without uh, knowing what God wants and listening to his voice and having the experience of walking with the Holy Spirit. It's also important uh, for us to be able to understand the intensity that God puts on prayer, too. Like Ray was reading earlier this morning or reciting, Colossians 4.2 says, Be devoted to prayer. So it's not just something that I do, but it's something that I'm pursuing passionately. And I'm committed to this. I'm devoted to to learning how to grow up in this whole particular area. And then a lot of our want, people will say, well, I don't have this or that, or we're in trouble here or there. James 4.2 goes on to say, you don't have because you don't ask God. Uh, a lot of it is we start thinking, well, what person can help me with this or that? And the first place we start is just making known to God. He says, make your request known to God with prayers and petitions, uh, with thanksgiving, and then he will uh, receive those prayers, and he will be able to respond to that. And there's great peace once we've really brought that to him, brought that to him, and leave it with him. So this morning, when we're talking about it, the first level uh, is our prayers that we start with. And when we begin praying, it's usually pretty selfish, you know, pretty self-directed. I don't know about you, the first prayers I can remember are the ones my parents taught who didn't know the Lord, but they had heard this prayer and they thought their kids should pray it. You know, Have you ever heard this, uh, now you lay me down to sleep? I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I am, I was thinking, even as a youngster, so are we worried about dying tonight? You know, I'm years old and I'm thinking that's the whole crux of the prayer is if I die before the morning, I hope God takes whatever a soul is, you know. Uh, and people start that way and we begin to move on from there into, you know, things mostly about my life and my family uh, because those are closest to home and mostly requests. Here's what I want. This is what I desire. And we begin to work through uh, that part of our life. And Sometimes people don't go any further than that. They present their laundry list to the Lord in the morning. It's kind of like, you know, the gentleman's gentleman or a maid or whatever, and you just kind of flip out this list and you just say, would you take care of these things today? I want you to take care of my family, our finances, my health. And when I'm done talking, I'm done with prayer. Um, I think Scripture tells us, and Jesus modeled something that has more to it than that. And so I hope to go on and, and speak of that that a little bit more clearly. Uh, 
I also wanted to sing a song that we will do together. You're feeling rowdy? <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're going to sing this Acapulco, and I want you to be able to uh, help me out. All right? And some of you remember what goes with it. So we'll go through it one time, and then we'll try this. Okay? You ready? Yeah. He who began a good work in you. Hey, you're forgetting the point. Began a good work in you. Will be faithful to complete it. Faithful to complete it. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it. You. Okay, not very good. <laughs> this definitely is not recordable. Let's try it again. But you know, part of this is your finger, so make sure it works, all right? So you, and each time it says you, you give a point to somebody preferably different, uh, and you're just reminding them God has started something good in you that he wants to bring to completion. And I'm praying for that, okay? Ready? He who began a good work in you. He who began a good work in you. Will be faithful to complete it. Faithful to complete it. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you. Good. That's getting a lot better. All right. Those of you who want to, will stay after church today and we'll keep practicing. So. Do you remember any of those first prayers and kind of how they were directed and where you were at? And again, most of those, like I say, are pretty selfish. Um, and as time goes on, and it's not because God doesn't want to know what your requests are. I think as we mature in this first level of prayer, uh, we begin to maybe examine some of the scriptures for instance, where it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, to pray without ceasing. And you think, well, that's impossible. How do you do that? Um, but I think the way God wants it to happen is a very practical matter. And it's to begin, as we grow, to bring everything before the Lord. So uh, sometimes people say, well, I don't need to pray about everything. And maybe you don't. But I do, because I don't know how to pray without ceasing without praying for everything. And I'm learning that my speech is not what it's supposed to be. If I'm speaking in the natural, there's all kinds of stuff that come out that's not what Jesus would say, uh, or the way that he'd express it. Even if it's not naughty, it's not helpful. And so uh, this begins to change in my speech. Jesus said in John 12, 49 and 50, I only say what I hear the Father saying, and in the way that he says to say it, because I know that his words lead to eternal life. So one of the things you might say, well, I don't need to pray before I go home at night and see my wife. Um, again, maybe you don't. <laughs> I do, because I go home and I'm thinking, I am really hungry. I sure hope dinner's ready. It's been a long day. I need some loving and care and all that. And so I go in this with this expectations and anything sh short of what's way up here, I'm disappointed. And I realize that's probably not what Jesus would do. And if I'm thinking ahead of time and thinking, I'm almost home. And, Lord, what would Jesus do when he got home? And thinking, I'll bet your wife's tired. I'll bet it's been a long day for her. I'll bet uh, if dinner's not ready, there's a good reason. And uh, maybe there's something that you ought to do. You wouldn't think of in the natural, but would be really a great gift to her when you meet together tonight. I don't just need to do that once a week. Every time I go home... Whenever we have meetings, I've seen meetings that have just been devastating, you know, and hurtful. And I thought, how much did I prepare beforehand to be able to speak what Jesus speaks? So it tells us, you know, in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 10, verse 5, it says, bring every thought captive into obedience for Christ. And so I'm thinking whenever I'm in a meeting, when I'm with people, uh, when I'm trying to communicate or deciding right actions, I want to do what Jesus did. And it says in uh, John 5, 19, that I only do what I see the Father doing. So I'm asking, how would you do this? Not just how you would speak, but how you would do this. So as I go on this level one, it's realizing that, for me at least, there's nothing outside of everything that I want to bring under his authority and his control. And the Holy Spirit who lives in us is waiting for 
permission. He's not going to kick the door down to your heart, but he's waiting for permission. Do you want to do this? Are you still good enough to do this on your own? Yeah, yeah. Or would you like me to take the lead? And if you ask, I'll do it as long as you'll follow. If we just want to know what his opinion is, we don't want to follow, you'll find that that distance uh, of his voice gets further and further apart. So what happens is we start out pretty selfish, and then we begin to mature, and it goes from what I want to more and more what he wants. What do you want today? What do you want from this conversation? What do you want from my marriage? What do you want with my money? I mean, what do you want with every part of my life? There's no part that I want you to leave untouched. And I want to be more and more like you want me to be. And that's like Jesus. So that it's about God's wants and not Jerry's. If we come to that kind of a place in this level, then God says, would you like to take another step? And when we do that, we begin to think, I, I really need to understand how you think and how you make decisions and how that's different than how I make decisions. Because I'm serious about this pilgrimage. Uh, I don't want to stay in level one prayer, which I think most of the churches at people get started some kind of uh, prayer that's comfortable for them, and that's where they stay for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. God said, if you want to take another step up, I want you to learn how I think. And the best way to do that is with my word. Plant my word in your heart and begin to speak the things that I'm teaching you that are different from the rest of the world. So Isaiah 55, 7 and 8 says, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways aren't my ways. And then the next verse is, as high as the heavens are above the earth, uh, so are my thoughts and my ways above yours. So God's saying, they could not be further apart. And if you want to pray with my heart in this, then you need to be able to uh, understand how I think and what I want from this. Uh, and then our thinking begins to change and we begin to say, okay, uh, Lord, I'm willing to give up everything that I put my stand on in terms of personal preference, the world's wisdom, all of that. And I'd substitute that with what you have to teach me. So Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, all your ways, acknowledge him. God, I need you here even though this is a common event in my life, it's a redeemable event that ought to be better than it is already. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding in all your ways and he shall direct your paths. He'll make them straight. He'll show you. You don't have to take a lot of rabbit tracks. Let's do this thing right. Uh, so the people who have done this are the ones who have fallen back on him are humble enough in spirit to say, I need to be taught in every area of my life, and I know that you'll be faithful to do that. And everyone used in Scripture were people who got back to this uh, place of childlike faith. I'm willing to start not as an important person with a lot of wisdom and understanding, but Lord, I just I want to tell you, I need everything. All you got, I want it. And receive that. So, uh, Romans 8, 26 and 27 says uh, that the Spirit helps us in our midst of our weakness. He knows that we haven't got it all figured out and we're not all together, but he helps us in our weakness. And the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. And oftentimes it says with groans or utterances that are beyond human words. Um, so I don't know what you think about this, but uh, there are times when things happen in our life and there's no adequate words for that. Um, when my mom died, there was some some noise that came out of my... It was not planned or intended and there were other people around and it was just this uh, deep, deep and kind of loud groaning that just cried out. I'd never heard it before, never expressed it. Uh, more commonly, I see people who love ice cream or whatever go, oh, this is so good. Shouldn't be doing this, but it is so good, you know. Uh, we have, or we see a baby, and you just hear noises when people look at babies, you know. Uh, there might be some real words behind that, but they don't come out. It's just kind of, oh, you know. Um, my wife and I are taking over a baby carrier that Betty gave. It's just a little perambulator. It's real cute and old, and just for uh, one of our granddaughters to play with. And my first thought is, this is just more stuff, you know. <laughs> we can take it over in southeastern Washington, Susie's, and she goes, oh, you know, <laughs> it's so cute. 
uh, we have something inside of us that just says they're just words that aren't necessary or functional in this setting here. And so scripture says that the spirit intercedes and will even uh, bring this out. And I'm grateful for a prayer language. Yeah. It's uh, words that I, I don't understand, but it's a gift from the Holy Spirit. And when I come to a place where uh, we've had our children's lives have been at stake at times, and I cried my eyes out and I poured my words out, uh, and then something else just comes in and the Holy Spirit expresses what I had no ability to express before and puts that whole thing at the feet of Jesus. And there's this, that's good. Mm -hmm. Everything that needed to be said was said. And I'm confident in the one that I've laid this at his feet. And he's got it, and he'll take it from here. So uh, this is the scripture, this uh, Romans 8, 26 and 27. It goes on to say, and when the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, he will intercede in a way that brings us in to alignment with the will of God. Yes. So I can tell God what I want. I want you to fix this, and I want you to fix that. But now I understand that my part is to understand how you think and what your will is and what brings glory to your name. And this has been expressed perfectly. And now, Lord, I'm trusting you because you're trustworthy. Uh, this is prayer number two. And basically it's based on the word of God. So we begin to pray for... Uh, the purposes and the promises of the will of God. And we can learn that from Scripture as we study that. We're not just reading other people's prayer and think, well, that was nice. We're thinking, how did they pray? They learned something that God wants me to know, or it wouldn't be in a book that's 4,000 years in the making. Um, there is something here that needs to change the way I do business with God in this, and I want to keep learning. Uh, everybody, that, like I said, that's been earnest about prayer, and I, I don't know if you uh, are tracking with me or if I sound like I'm speaking in tongues now, um, but I felt like uh, today the part that I play in this is basically, uh, Judy, given my testimony about prayer. This has been a 55-year journey with prayer, trying to walk through and understand uh, where God is taking us individually and collectively. So. Uh, Daniel was a guy that God used, and Daniel was just a youngster, probably a teenager, maybe 17 or 18, when he was taken to Babylon as a captive. He and a couple other guys decided they were going to be really earnest about that. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be really earnest about that, and so the first challenge that they had was they were asked to eat food that had been sacrificed to idols. So a lot of the meat that was supposed to be this rich fare of the king, and they were kind of raising up promising young men and uh, and putting them in positions of leadership to work for Babylon, even though they were captives. And he said, I won't do it. I won't eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols and took the risk of being killed for disobedience. And he just said, I'll, I'll do something. I'll make a deal with you, okay? If after 10 days we don't look better than all the other young people who are eating this fare because we're being obedient to God, then we'll go back and we'll eat what you tell us to. But if we look better and if we're doing better in this training process, uh, then will you let us continue because we're trying to be faithful to God. And God blessed them and they were ten times wiser and uh, elevated above all the rest of the young people that they were training for leadership. And then as time went on, this happened again, another opportunity. They were told they had to sacrifice and uh, worship only the king and an idol that he had made. And, they refused to do that. Some of you know about the furnace. And then chapter 6 of Daniel. Daniel uh, was had a lot of enemies because people were watching the way he was going through the ranks and the power that he had and the leadership that he exercised over this pagan culture that had uh, made them slaves, and yet he was the boss. So they decided they were going to uh, tell the king that he wouldn't worship the king. He only worshiped God. And Daniel prayed three times a day because he... He just knew whatever he was given to do. He couldn't do it well unless he just took time away to be with God and zeroing in, get back to square one again. This is all about you, God. This is what I do. I live for you. And so no matter what the cost. So they said nobody can pray for the next 30 days to anybody but the king. Daniel opened up his window so everybody could see him. He got down on his knees and he, he prayed towards Jerusalem and prayed to God. I worship no one else. So... Uh, these guys who were upset with him grabbed him and brought him into the king and 
they were gonna they threw him into a lion's den. A lot of you have heard that story, and God kept him through the night. Just, you love me, you serve me, I'll care for you. And uh, they pulled him out, and the king was loved Daniel, and he was so excited about it, he just embraced him and held on to him and said, there's no God like your God. You know, it was a tremendous witness. And then he took the guys who accused Daniel and threw them into the pit, just in case people might think those lions just weren't hungry before they hit the floor. Uh, they were goners. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what you think about all that, but this is real life. And uh, we have to decide if God is somebody who intervenes in real life to make a difference in the way we live our life and then the impact of that difference on the world around us. Or are we just like everybody else? So the next level, when we come to a place where we want to start uh, really honoring God, let me give you one more thing about Daniel in chapter 9. Daniel, as he went on, I, I said the second level is mostly about the scriptures and learning how to pray the scriptures, God's purpose and God's promises. In chapter 9, uh, Daniel begins to give this prayer to God, and he says, Jeremiah, who is his senior by 20 years, had this prophecy that God had told him, even though you're captives in Babylon, uh, I will release you at year 70 and send you back. You're not going to be exiles forever. And so this is year 67. Nothing's changed. It's as bad now as it's ever been, maybe worse. And Daniel had gone through four kingdoms in this whole process. And so Daniel just uh, was reading the prophecy and brought it before God and said, God, you've told me that your word is true and you've told me to pray your word. So he said, Daniel said, or Jeremiah said in 70 years, it's year 67. So God, you've got three years, okay? Because <laughs> things are as bad now as ever. Anybody know what happens at year 70? They were released in one night. God changed everything, but he needed somebody who would stand on what he said. I think he's still looking for that from you and I. What does his word say? And then do you stand on that for your children? Do you stand on that for your finances, for your marriage, for this country? You know, I, I guess every day I would say I hear people complain about uh, Donald Trump or our government or the mess that our culture is in morally. I'm wondering, do we pray as much as we complain? If you're in Sunday school, James says, don't grumble. Uh, but we're spending a lot of time grumbling and probably not nearly as much time praying. God says the grumbling won't change anything. The praying could change men and nations. And so we have to have the same understanding as Scripture gives us about that. If we begin to consider God's desires and wants more than our own, if praying has evolved in our lives to the place where it's more important to us to be alone with God, to hear God, and to walk with God than anything else in life. Then we've moved into another arena, and I think that's the intercession level. We come into a place where an intercessor, first of all, is someone who has intimacy with God. Sometimes people say, well, an intercessor is somebody who just prays about one thing. Couldn't you do that at the first level? I mean, couldn't you just pray about having a lot of money or your parents or whatever? You know, we can pray about one thing at any other level. It doesn't mean it's bad, but it does not distinguish intercession. That's part of it, but it's not the focus of that. The thing that causes intercession to thrive is intimacy and obedience. God knows you're someone that he could speak to, and you would act on what he tells you. And if you're at that place, then you have a different kind of relationship with him. One of the deals for uh, maturing in your prayer life, whether it's Moses, Abraham, David, Joseph, or Al, or Sherry, or whoever, is you get to a place where, Lord, everything is yours. It's, it's all yours. Because anything that's not becomes a hindrance in that movement and in our obedience. We think, well, if I do that, then this and this and this will happen, and I'm not sure I'm there yet. God says, I've got plenty of time to wait. It's you that have the problem with time. If you're ready to keep going, then everything is laid bare and open before him. And uh, each of these guys lost everything that I just mentioned. And everybody in the Bible who went further into their life with God had to have everything removed. So you think through the story of Moses and think through the story of Abraham and Joseph and David. 
Uh, they had everything taken off the table for them. Uh, and even Job, who went through these difficult things. But in place of that, they got the life of God. Uh, that came in like nobody can know when God is one of many things in your life. He becomes the critical issue in your life. And then when he is the preeminent issue, uh, these guys had things, whether it was John or James or Paul would say, I've been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's all about that relationship. And, and when he does that, uh, then we have this experience of depth and intimacy with him. James says something similar in John 2. First John 2, uh, 15 to 17, and James 4.4. 4, and uh, they all got to this place where you're the you're it for me, God, and I trust you. You're generous and kind and loving, but you don't want me to compete with any other idol or any other false god. When I'm at that place, then I can begin to move on to a place of divine romance. And you know, I I didn't grow up in a family that hugged or said I love you, um, any of those kinds of things. It was really strange for us to hear that. We thought it was weak. You know, we'd see. People say that, and we just think, oh, you know, that, <laughs> you know, for us, um, my heart's changed about that. I love to hug, and I love when we can say I love you to one another and really mean it. And God moves us into a divine romance with him. And you have to know that he's real before you can move into a relationship that's that intimate. So, for instance, in uh, uh, Genesis, Chapter 5, verses 21 to 24, talks about Enoch. Enoch's father was Jared. His son was Methuselah. He's kind of sandwiched in between these two guys. And it says, Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more. Uh, I get this picture in my mind of God showing up at the door first thing every morning. and said, Enoch, are you home? And he said, yes, I've been standing here at the door waiting, Lord, till you came. And, and he said, well, come on, let's go for a walk. i got so much I want to share with you. So excited about being with you today. And Enoch says, oh, it is the best part of my day. And so I go out for a walk for half an hour, and then it was an hour, and then it was 10 hours. And finally, I get back, try to get back before dark, you know. And this goes on and on. And finally, the scripture says, and then he was no more. God said, you know what? I'm not satisfied with this hour or 10 hours a day. I just want you with me all the time. So we're going to go for a walk and not come back, Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking, all right, I'll take that. Mm -hmm. This is the divine romance that uh, God is wooing us uh, to that's closer and closer to his heart. Sometimes people wonder, and I used to tell my kids when I was doing youth ministry, I want you to read Song of Songs. You know, it's this intimate relationship between a man and a woman, and some of it's kind of graphic, you know, and you, I think, well, they're, they're in bad enough shape already. I'm not going to have them read this and then try to explain all this stuff to them. So. I didn't read it for a long time. And then I began to realize it's a divine romance. It's intimacy with God that, in a way, God can only express. So, like Song of Solomon uh, 710, says, You belong to me, and you are my desire. This is God speaking to you. You belong to me. Uh, New Testament would say we were bought with a price. But you belong to me and my desire is for you. It's not because I can rule over you or control you or hurt you. I just want to hang out with you. I, I love you like a much-loved friend. Um, and just a beautiful experience with that. Solomon, Son of Solomon uh, 8, 7 says, If all of a person's wealth were offered up for love, it would be utterly scorned. In other words, you don't have enough to buy this kind of love. Nobody does. This is something completely otherworldly. And God has said, I want to woo you into a relationship uh, that's beyond anything that you can purchase with this world. It'll cost you everything. You'll have to choose me first. It involves time, energy, passion, choosing him over other things that happen in our life. But that's what I want, God. It's a small price. And I know that there's nothing of the world's good that could purchase that. It's just offering up my life and my heart. Uh, and as we do that, then God begins, like I said, to woo us into a deeper place of intimacy, which is the critical issue in intercession. Um, and he's faithful to that intimacy. We've had people let us down, broken our hearts. That'll never happen with God. He's absolutely faithful 
in the midst of all of that. He's always trying to get us away to be with himself. So like uh, Mark 6, 31, it says, Come away by yourself with me to a quiet place and get some rest. Um, there is something that happens when it's just you and him. And he's always wooing you away. You know, I know you're busy. I know you're responsible. I know you have a lot of stuff. But I want you. I want you to be with me. And I want it to be just us. So most of intercession is personal and individual time. If you think it's intercession just to meet with a group once a week and you're going to talk about one thing, uh, that's too small. But if you have experienced intercession and God is wooing you away to be with him, then you come together with others who have that same experience and you're like this. Uh, because he didn't call us into this thing to make it, again, one of many things, but we have been to a place of intimacy with him that we know these others have been as well. And then what God calls us to do in the Holy Spirit is just powerful. Uh, Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says to bring our requests to God with thanksgiving, make them known, and then we leave them with him. And it goes on to say, and then the peace of God which passes all understanding will quiet your hearts and your minds uh, so that you have the mind of Christ. When we're drawn away into this thing, uh, and again, this might sound strange, but I believe it's absolutely true, is when we're caught up in his spirit to be wooed away into this divine romance, he takes us to a place whether you feel like you've been taken up into heaven or uh, wherever, but it's a place separate from everything else in this world. So all the fears, all the concerns, all the anxiety, all the ruptured relationships, all of those things are gone. It's above and outside of this world's experience. So when we're still at level one, level two, I mean, we're slugging away and fighting. How are we going to pay the rent? You know, what about this growth in my lung or whatever else? That's changed. Uh, this is above that. So it's the peace that passes all understanding. Someone says, you're nuts. You know, don't you realize the problem you're in? And people who have been drawn away know I have this hidden place with him. It's above all those other worldly concerns. It says in 1 John 4, 18, that perfect love casts out fear. So everything that we're afraid of, everything that moves us to move away from trust and confidence in God is removed when we're in this perfect place. Uh, someone described it as liquid love. He just loves you. He's just excited about you and he's close. And even when he has to chastise you or admonish you or exhort you or whatever else, it's not like, now I got you by the throat, you're a goner. But it's like when he says something, I just feel like he's just bathing me in love because he loves me so much and he's wooed me to himself and I can experience this thing in the presence of perfect love and nothing else can bear up it's like a, uh, th those lights Al you know that kill germs the, is it ultraviolet or whatever they have you know yeah just this perfect love just kills everything that would destroy your faith it would so we have this place of rest like I don't have a problem anymore I don't have uh, anything that I think he can't have, handle yeah. anymore. I'm just enjoying this place with him. And I think we have uh, a new kind of freedom in Christ. Uh, Jesus said in, in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And so what I'm doing now is I'm so uh, distracted by the world. I'm so visceral and, and uh, sensitive to all those things that are going on around me. But when I'm with him, I have this place of uh, peace that passes all understanding, but I also know that the kingdom of heaven is already within me. It's not just some day, and I get a chance to visit that kingdom that's otherworldly. And uh, unless you've been there, you don't know what that is. But God says, "I want you to know. If you're missing out on this, you're missing out on so much. I won for you on the cross." And then we become followers of God who have this great freedom and we become one with the Godhead in this place so some of you read Jesus is calling and this week it had a deal about this oneness is not just merging it's not like just moving into the same lane you know with traffic with God and where God's going but somehow it does this it, he says that you would be in complete unity that you would be one and that this would be a witness to the world and you would be able to see that God loves you as much as he loves Jesus which is hard for us to put together, hard for me anyway to put together, but it's the truth. So we have this place that's, again, otherworldly and exciting. Still with me so far? 
Uh, okay, if you have any questions on one, two, or even the beginning of intercession, just open up for that because I don't want to lose anybody. Um, part of what I want to do too is if some of this is new, that you just be leaning forward because it's such good stuff that God has for us. And when we get kind of razzled inside and distracted and we just think, I don't know if I can take much more of this, God's already made a provision. This. You could be at the doctor's office. I mean, you could be getting your driver's license or whatever else, and all this is going on. I had a moving experience at, at a root canal this week. You know, usually I'd be thinking, ah, this hurts, you know, and what's he doing? Why does it take so long and all that stuff? Uh, it was such a sweet time for two hours. And uh, and when we were done, the doctor just grabbed me, who's a new new to me, and he just said, would you pray for me? And he was an hour behind because of my thing. And he said, would you just go into my office? I had a glass window, so people kept walking by looking. And then he just said, I need help with my shoulders. This work is hurting. My family's got all kinds of problems. He just started unloading. And I thought, Lord, we don't really even know each other. But there's something that went on during the midst of this work that God said, uh, there's a piece here that you need to know. And so he was able to move on to the next thing. He, he does that with all of us. Sometimes we're distracted by the circumstance instead of uh, bringing that divine romance into the bakery or the grocery store or the gas station. God said, I got my people all over and I want you to be that one who can bring that kingdom in uh, with them. So uh, I'll try to pick this up a little bit quicker too. I don't want you to be late for your turkey. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that we need to have in our heart is this confidence about God's affection for us. Uh, Jeremiah 33, 3 tells us, call to me. We get into this place of intimacy and there's nothing you can't talk to me about. Call to me and I'll show you great and wonderful things you don't know. Jeremiah 31, uh, 3 says, and I have drawn you with cords of loving kindness. I've loved you with an everlasting love. It's not just for today. This is always the way I've felt about you. But I want you to come into the reality of the awareness of that and not be afraid to come boldly to the throne of grace. And when he speaks to us, and this is true for everybody in the Bible uh, that he's used, he speaks to us uh, things that are otherworldly too, in dreams and visions and prophetic experiences and revelations. So we have this sense of intimacy first. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. I don't come in with my laundry list. And when this intimacy is, begins uh, to blossom and mature, um, then he says, I've got some things I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about your wife, or I want to talk to you about your finances, or I want to talk to you about your children. And he, he just fills those conversations, not with panic or fear, but with love, and gives us insight we'd never have. Um, some of you heard the story of Noah, my youngest son, and he just went crazy when he was about five or six years old, stabbed his brother with a pair of scissors in the back of his hand, and there was blood all over, and, and his mom came up to rescue the situation, and then he threatened his mom, you know. That was too far for me. They called me from the church at Midway there and said, come home, and I was going to give him the best spanking he's ever got, you know, to let him know this is not permissible. And in the midst of my haste and frustration, you know, I'm going to give him a good one. God said, don't you dare. He's got a broken heart. If you do that, you'll ruin your relationship with him and mine with him. And so I just got down on my knees and he's still, you know, out with his scissors. And I just said, no, I am so sorry. And I started to cry. And he dropped his scissors and we hugged and... I said, can we go for a walk? You know, kind of felt like Enoch, you know. We went for a walk, and he just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. But by the time we got home, <sighs> you're hard to look at. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, by the time we got home, uh, there was a whole other place with the whole family as well as with us. And I thought, you know, the wisdom of the world would say, this is not permissible, and I'm going to teach something you'll never forget. And God said, uh, you'll lose the relationship. That's the greatest thing in the kingdom. So... Um, I think the the point for that, uh, and Noah, by the way, is one of the most tender-hearted men I know of now. At six three and two hundred fifty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to give him a swat a couple of times, but it's, too late. Yeah, 
Yeah, he just thinks I'm being nice. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, one of the first things is this: uh, the, being open. God, I, I want to hear and see in any way you can get through all those brain cells that so stuck on the world's wisdom that you can speak about things that are going to happen, that have happened, that I can do better, uh, so that it's all about Him and not out panic. And then the next thing is the voice of the Lord. He's promised to speak. My sheep hear my voice. Uh, they know me, and I know them, and I know them by name, and they follow. So you don't just hear, but I promise God, whatever you say, I'll do. And, uh, you know, John 10, 4, and 27, and Isaiah uh, 30, 21 says, And as you walk along, you'll hear a voice behind you mm -hmm. speaking into your ear. This is the way that you should go, whether you turn to the right or left. I'll tell you how to do this right. But you got to ask. You know, if we think we're so smart in any area, like I got this, I need your help over here, but this, I got this. Um, friends, that's a recipe for brokenness and disaster. So everything, Lord, bring every thought captive into obedience for Christ. Uh, and then, so his, this being open to any way that he'd speak to us, his voice. The third thing is learning about his love, just how much you're loved. Zechariah 2.8 says, that you are the apple of his eye. I don't know how you feel like you are uh, to other people, what value you have in front of other people. But I can tell you the value you have before Christ. He loves you enough to give up his life for you. And when people talk about you, they're talking about the apple of his eye. Again, today in the scriptures, uh, Pastor Dave was talking about you know, not grumbling and not saying things we shouldn't say about people. But if I'm thinking, you know, that uh, Larry is the apple of his eye and I'm thinking about saying something that I shouldn't say, thinking God's here, he's hearing this, and this is his favorite, you know. Uh, I, am, I don't want to be a part of that because it'll hurt him, and not just my brother. So we have this relationship now about being open to hear, knowing his voice, which gets clearer and clearer as we get deeper and deeper, and then this love understanding. Uh, do you remember the Psalm 42? There's a sweet song, As the Deer Pants After the Water. Um, it's a, such a sweet, wooing song, and it basically just says, I love you so much, and you're so precious to me. I just want to get closer and closer to you. So the psalmist who's writing in there says, I know about this kind of stuff, and I never have enough of it. And it just says, like the deer who pants for water. I wrestled for a long time, and we lost a lot of weight uh, by not drinking um, any water. And I know what it is to be desperately thirsty, but thinking eight ounces, that's more than I can put on for the scales for my weight class. And so I've been really thirsty, and I've thought about these deer who wander in the wilderness without any place to get a drink. And he says, that's how it is with me. I just need to be with you. It's a dear pants for water. So my soul longs for God. My soul longs for the living God. When can I go away and be with my God? I know there's a lot of stuff going on, but I need one thing. I need more of you, and I know that you want that from me. Um, I'll just keep going here until you guys start leaving. Uh, just another part of this is becoming a warrior for God. Uh, a lot of times we think, well, who am I? I mean, I'm just asking for him to take care of business today. I just like to survive. And God said, that's not big enough. I want you to think about everything that I've created and why I've created you. So his purposes, his promises, uh, his plans that I'm a part of. And I don't know what those are because his thoughts are not my thoughts and my ways aren't his ways until he tells me. And so I really want to ask that. And one of the first things that happens when we understand being really a warrior for God to go out into the world is that we have a real enemy. And sometimes that's downplayed in our society, but Jesus said this is for real. And Scripture continually reaffirms it. So First Peter 5, 8 says he's like a roaring lion. And we first started this little fellowship. It's one of the first Scriptures he brought to us. It's like a roaring lion that wanders around trying to see who he devours. And uh, Revelation 12, 11 says, 12, 12 says that his time is short. And that he's furious. So he's not going to let an opportunity slip by to get you. And so when we're talking about being a spiritual warrior, we need to know, first of all, we have a real enemy. And to my way of thinking, friends, we only have one enemy. It's not the guy that stole my car. You know, It's not the guy that cut my wages or uh, the guy that hurt my daughter or whatever. It's, it's not my enemy. I just have one. And I need to know who that is so I can stay focused. 
And then it tells us that the weapons we use, even though we're part of the world, we don't use the weapons the world uses. In Second Corinthians 10, 3, to 4, 3 and 4, uh, it says the weapons we use have divine power to bring down strongholds. So the real evil, the real enemy behind all of that stuff, when I'm interceding, God lets me see that. So it looks like I'm going to be going uh, with a couple others to the Middle East again, and God is doing miraculous things, uh, some of which we can't tell you right now, but the highest levels of government uh, are coming to Washington, D.C. with us in February, and just... Uh, there's a movement that's just stunning through all of this. And you think of all the evil that's been perpetrated and all the people that have died there and what's behind that. And if we know what that is, then we can really go after it with divine weapons to bring down strongholds in areas that's been unmovable by guns and bombs and all those other things. It's just gotten worse. But God can do something that brings healing and changes the whole circumstance. And, uh, and I'm excited about that, and we'll tell you more later, but uh, this is where we have to function at an intercessory level. Um, maybe some areas just to mention specifically. I'm throwing stuff out because for another day. Uh, some of the areas to be concerned about are, are salvation issues. For instance, when Jesus said, go into all the world, Matthew 28, make disciples, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me, and Teach them everything that I've taught you. So every one of you have a sphere of influence. And whatever that sphere of influence is, you have a responsibility. God says, I want you, first of all, to show them what it's like to be in intimate, uh, divine romance with me. So they know this isn't religion. We're not calling anybody to religion. We're calling them to life in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I better be able to model that first, teaching them to obey what I've taught you. And then we kind of woo them in and they can see something they can grab a hold of. Uh, the poor, you know. Whatever you've done for the least one of these, you've done for me. And so it's a responsibility. And when you're in intercession, God will say, it's not just generic, putting another $10 in the plate. There's something that I've called you to that you can have an impact on this. And uh, also, you know, we, we think, well, I just in Des Moines. I was raised in Burien. I thought if I made it to Tacoma... It would be beyond my wildest dreams. Uh, but God has got a different plan. So he says in Isaiah uh, 19, and I'm, I'm praying on the plane one time, and I'm just thinking, Lord, I am the lowest man on the totem pole. You could pick anybody who could do a better job. But why am I doing this? And he says, because I've given you a vision and a mission, and you're willing to go. Uh, Isaiah 19 says this. It says that in that day, this is a prophecy just like the one Daniel followed with Jeremiah. In that day, there'll be a highway between Assyria, Iran, this area, and Egypt. And the two will come together and worship. And there'll be a third, Israel. And I will call Assyria my handiwork, Egypt my people, and Israel my inheritance. Uh, God has this plan that nobody in the world would buy into. But I believe it because it's God's word. And there are people who are in this place of intimacy with God who have taken his promises and will remind him like Daniel did about the 70 years and said, God, you said this, now we're going to go for it uh, and see this become a reality. I don't think everybody will be changed, but I think that there will be many people from this whole Middle East that will be one for Christ. Um, okay, how about uh, Ezekiel 22:30? Florence... Ezekiel 22.30 says, I looked for a person who would stand in the gap, but I could find none. And um, it's so tragic because the next verse that follows that, it says, I would want to relent from the wrath that I'm going to pour out, but because there was no one, I'm going to bring them under judgment. And it's not an isolated text. I was reading Amos 7 in the first couple uh, first six verses there, and it just says this, I, because of the sins of the nation and their failure and their rebelliousness, it says I'm going to bring, you know, uh, uh, locusts on the land, and they're going to strip it clean, and everything that you need, the idea is that everything that's important, whether it's a stock market that crashes or whatever, everything that you depend on for your livelihood and income and commerce and all of that, I'm going to wipe it completely out. I've given you enough chances. This has gone on long enough. 
And Amos began to pray. And he said, oh, God, we're so small. We're so desperate. We can't do anything without you. God, if you do this, we'll be completely wiped out. And so God says, I relent. I won't do it. And then God says, but I think what I'm going to do is bring a fire. And this fire is going to come and consume everything, even the water that you depend on. It'll all be gone. And Amos said, oh, God, please, we need you. We've sinned. We've failed you in every way. But God, we ask that you would relent. God says, I relent. I stand in the, and look for a man or a woman who would stand in the gap and would pray, but I couldn't find any. Does God just kind of throw out threats and then kind of get rid of them? I, I think not. Tells us in Ezekiel 33, 11, I don't delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would repent and turn. And if there is somebody who would stand in the gap and would ask for repentance for our nation, for our people, for ourselves, God's promised to turn things around. <coughs> But if there's no one, and if there's no one who will intercede to cause this repentance to begin to be a movement, then his judgment is sure, and it will come. Um, so we've got to be able to stand, trust God, believe that his intentions are good, but he wants to work through each of us who are willing to go into a different place to meet with him, to be led by the Holy Spirit to know his will and to see that changed. Second Chronicles 7.14 you know this one, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. God's promise to us, if we take that and we bring it before him in this place of intimacy so the Spirit can teach us how that can be affected for the real world. First Chron or Second Chronicles 16.9 says, The eyes of the Lord go to and fro, over all of the land to see those whose hearts are fully committed to him so that he can strengthen them. He wants to bless you and use you. And I believe that intercession can impact not only individuals but nations. And I believe he's called you to do that. And when we start to move this way personally in our own life, then we can gather together as intercessors and it's a whole different place of prayer than just praying for my aunt's grandmother's uncle, you know. And some of the personal things that are maybe real or just selfish. But God says there's more. And I want to take you there. Amen? Okay. Father, we love you with all of our hearts. Lord, we need to understand what you do that's different than what the rest of the world does. And uh, some of us are stuck. Uh, we've been doing the same things the same way for a long time. And, Lord, today's not meant to be uh, criticism in any way. It's just meant to be there's more. There's an opportunity to do something that the world without Christ can't do and to experience him together in a way that changes the world. We believe this, and those, Lord, who have stood on your promises have changed the world around them. We want to be like that. And Lord, when has there ever been a time that's been more desperate for people who get this? So help us, Lord, and open up our hearts for the sake of your name. Amen.